Hello, Blazer fans. Welcome to the summer edition of the Blazer Power Hour. We've got a, a special uh, series that we're going to run throughout the summer. That's why I'm flanked here by two of my friends and co-workers here at Progress. I've got Lance McCarthy and Justin Rice with me. Hello, fellows. How are you doing? Hello. Wonderful hey, to be here, Ed. So this summer, I... I reached out to Lance and I said, uh, you've got some really cool stuff going on. Let's do a blazer solar power hour. Uh, Lance, uh, you work a lot with uh, solar power panels and you have them on, on your homes and you're quite the expert in all things solar power. And uh, we, we have some project ideas around this whole solar power theme. So I, I Thought it'd be nice to have like a, an ongoing series this summer that's based around the topic of solar power and we'll build some things, right? So uh, before we get started talking about what exactly we're going to do, let's talk about who we've got here. Um, I just gave a kind of shout out to Lance and Justin here, but why don't you guys uh, take a moment to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do, uh, what you know, maybe some of your hobbies and things are. Uh, Lance, go kick it off. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lance McCarthy uh, at Progress Software. My team is responsible for doing the technical support for the DevTools products. So like your Kendos and your Blazor and WPF and all the different kind of controls that you use from us run into a problem. You either give us a call or you open a support ticket. It's my team and my colleagues who do that for you. And um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP in Windows development, .NET stuff, mixed reality stuff, rest in peace, mixed reality. Um, it, over the years, I've done a lot of that, given back to the community because it's done so much for me. Uh, so that's a corollary benefit. The best part is to get to meet all of you, uh, interact with everyone, and hopefully watching the show we've met before in person or at an event or a hackathon. Hackathons are my favorite. Um, that leads into my other hobby. It's like, wait, your hobby is also your job? Yeah, it's kind of a gray area. I like doing it, and it's coincidental that I like coding, and I happen to get paid for it, too, so it's a win-win. But other than that, um, I like traveling. I like doing electronics and gadgets. As a matter of fact, in the background, you might see some, like, tooling and stacks of components from everywhere near and there. And um, what the part of the show is going to be about is like self-hosting and home lab stuff. So I like doing home networking. I get a little router that I can see what's going on and cool LEDs and home automation. Um, that has been a new thing for me, which I think will help contribute to our project this summer. Nice. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin Rice. I'm a member of Lance's team, a technical support engineer here at Progress. Um, it's my second year uh, in the industry, so I'm still pretty new, uh, pretty fresh. Blazor is really the first technology that I've, I've learned to the extent that I have, you know, aside from building some projects in school with WinForms and Xamarin and so, and the like. Uh, for hobbies, I really enjoy mountain biking, uh, being outside, taking hikes, and uh, just spending time with my family and children. I, I invited you guys on the show. Um, I myself am, you know, obviously a Blazor developer, but uh, you know, I I like to tinker with projects that kind of have some uh, claws into the real world. And I've done things on the show before that have been, you know, fictitious. I've tried to make things up, um, and they've been fun. Like uh, we built a, a trip to. Uh, Mars, like a um, an Uber for space travel on the show before, and that was a lot of fun. That was called uh, Blazeport, and uh, you know you could click, you know, the Moon, Mars, some other places, and get a, an estimated like cost and travel time and things to those using some machine learning, some Blazor stuff like that. But we never really had on this show like something that was useful in the real world. And I was talking to Lance and Lance has like all this solar power knowledge. And I was like, let's build something to do with solar power. Like solar power is an essential thing that is part of our, our lives and becoming more and more, you know, 
uh, mainstream, I guess you could say, a uh, little, you know, little later than we probably could have used all the solar power tech that we have, but it's catching on pretty rapidly now. And I was like, what if we build something with this? So, uh, Lance, like what, what type of solar power stuff are you dabbling with at your, your homes? Yeah, we should definitely start there. Let's talk about what it is we're going to build this on top of, right? Um, we should first discuss what kind of solar systems there are, right? It's like, oh, I'm a homeowner and I could get solar power. There's something called hybrid, off-grid, and grid system. I won't go too deep into details, but you can think of it in two columns. One is you're completely disconnected from the utility company. You get all your power through the panels and save it on a battery and you, that's it, you're isolated. Another one with the hybrid capability is you can uh, you can get any energy you need that you're not generating already and only get a little bit that's self-powered. Like let's say you generate 90% and you only ingest 10%. And there's the battery part of the hybrid system where you can have solar by itself. You don't have to have any batteries. Right, so your house is powered for free during the day. When the sun goes down, then you get energy from the grid. You can add a battery to that. Some people might be familiar with the term Tesla power wall, right? The power wall is just a battery that gets put on the wall. And when the sun comes in and hits the panels, it generates the current, right? And you have the ability to either send it to the battery or send it to the home. You can do both. You send it to the home and whatever is left over gets trickled charged into the battery. You have a surplus and you store that surplus throughout the day. Then when the sun goes down and the solar panels aren't making electricity anymore, the battery instead starts powering the house. So you can imagine like water filling up the, the house and then flowing into the battery and then it gets emptied. Depending on how much, how many solar panels you have, how much energy you're generating, and how many batteries you have that may or may not power you through the entire night. Let's say it only halfway through the night. And when the battery runs out, then it switches to the grid. So you can have different levels of this. What I have here in the house that I'm currently in is, um, because we're in Boston, we don't have the greatest sunlight. Right? It's three or four months a year, I'm 100% self-powered with the battery. But as we get into September and October, the angle of the sun is too low and our days are shorter. So my battery will run out around two or 3 a.m. And then, you know, we use the grid for the rest of that. All of this needs to be tracked somehow, right? You need a system that says, this is how much energy you're getting in the panels. This is how much that's going into the battery. And this is how much the house needs. There are four four categories of this, which will go in into the app that this kind of data is useful. I, my house is generating a thousand volts right now, a uh, thousand watts, no volts. Uh, and the house needs, you know, 1500 watts. Let's take a little from the battery, the thousand and maybe a hundred from the grid. This needs to be intelligently managed. Uh, managed. Most solar systems come with this management system and uh, we'll be tapping into that. The other place is in Costa Rica. I'm lucky enough to have been able to find a property down there, lifelong dream, and we put solar panels on that. It's like at the top of a mountain, close to the equator, and the solar is unbelievable. So I think it's fortuitous that we are at the beginning of the summer, the panels are in Costa Rica, and we'll be getting our data from that. Hopefully I didn't go too off the rails there. Uh, do you have any questions about the setup? Um, so, in when you install something like this on it at your house, like I know there's got to be a couple different vendors and things like that. Like, are are there the known big players out there? Like, what what do people normally see? If uh, you know, I get ads for this stuff all the time, and yeah. I don't know what's a scam, what's real. Like, what's the gist of the landscape for for vendors out there? There are some scams, and it. Scam yeah, might not be the right word, but it is tricky. There are some of these uh, vendors that rent to you or they say, we'll give you solar panels for free and you get free electricity. But what happens is they own the panels and they attach it to your roof and then they get um, 
I don't know the specifics of it. I haven't read about it in over a year, but basically you can't sell your house if you, they don't want you to because it's their property attached to your property. It gets legally messy. So the best route is always to buy them, right? If you don't have the money on hand, you could lease it usually from the company. Not lease, lease is the bad one. Uh, you would take a loan and then pay it out over time. Uh, but it is much more complicated because you need approval from the city, you need approval from the from the electric company because you can't connect this type of system to them without them having the ability to cut you off. Let's say, for example, you have an electrician working on a pole down the street. What if your solar panels are pumping energy into that line and you kill the electrical worker, right? Because they thought it was dead. Uh, there's lots of laws and protections in place to prevent that. So your utility company can go and flip a switch and prevent your gen energy generation from energizing the line. There's lots of these different complications, which is why there exist these vendors that you get ads from. They handle everything under one roof, one contract. So they'll hire the electrician. They'll do all the paperwork with the city and your government, depending on your local laws. They'll handle the, uh, the installation. They have the vendors for who gets the stuff and the people they buy the hardware from. You said big player, right? Tesla is at the top of that list. I have a Tesla system here. Absolutely love it. In Costa Rica, I don't. Different country, different rules, right? It was easier just to buy things independently and set it up. Um, but yes, I would highly recommend going to one of those vendors. And depending on the name, right? There are several, it depends on where you live to. Each state has their own different vendors. Um, even Tesla, let's say you call Tesla, I want solar panels right now. They will look at the partners in the state that you live and contract with one of those. So when they, when they install something, is there, uh, I know we're going to get into software in a few minutes, but is there like one software that rolls them all and like all the vendors use it or does each one have their own and it's kind of, you know, like uh like apple for example like you're you're not gonna interface solar panel tesla with apple software type of thing yeah. just using those names as examples not saying apple has any kind of play in this but you know people are familiar with the walled garden of apple and and how pcs and apple don't work together so yeah. is is that the world we're dealing with or is there like open source type stuff that everybody's using there's a little of both so there is some segmentation when people want to control the brand, right? Tesla is a good example. Um, hopefully this comes across on screen. Right, so you can see the house yeah. there and then this is the Tesla app. So you can always open the Tesla app and you see how much energy is coming in from the solar panels. Right, so it tells me 2.8 kilowatts coming in from the solar panel, how much the house is using, how much is going to the battery, et cetera. And this software is Tesla software. Now, how they connect this app to the solar system is usually done over a standard. Um, one of those standards being MGTT, and this is a gateway. Um, people who are familiar with home networking might know what a gateway is. It's the thing that goes between connecting to your internet provider, right? You have a modem that, that detects the signals and then modulates it to work as ethernet. It takes whatever it is, fiber optic or cable, and then changes that into an Ethernet signal. But after that, it's still only one IP address. And how does the company know how to um, give you your Internet, right? That's done through the gateway. All of your Internet traffic goes into the gateway and then out to the, to the ISP. Similar kind of setup with solar. You have a piece of hardware. It's... It's like a mini modem. It's very thin and light, and it just plugs into your internet. It connects wirelessly to your system. And the communication between that system can be um, a variety of different protocols. It can be proprietary, depending on some system. Um, but it's usually a standard like MQTT or JSON protocols or different regular APIs. And you can intercept that traffic with Fiddler if you wanted to and break it down. But to your point, there is some areas that you can't really touch, and there's some that are easier to use. It comes down to what gateway that you purchased and what what that gateway allows you to do. 
So in the gateway, you might have a, an option to flip on an MQTT uh, broker, right? And then that access, that IP address will give you MQTT sim, signals. Mosquito, mm, mosquito MQTT, I always fumble those words. But it, think of it like JSON, right? So you have this payload that gets sent out for every signal. Um, but yeah, it comes down to the gateway. So there's there's some common gateways out there, and, and you've got you've got the one that does the MQTT output. Yeah. Sometimes the gateways are um, in, in integrated with the inverter. So I should describe what an inverter is. Um, so your house needs 120 volts, right? AC power. The 120 volts power that alternates in current, positive, negative, positive, negative, 60 times a second or 50 if you're in Europe. And your battery and the solar panels make DC power, right? very high current or um, say 24 volts. Panels vary, but there's a low voltage DC that's coming out of that. And your battery is also typically lower voltage, 40 volts or so. The inverter takes this DC voltage and goes to a full bridge rectifier. Full bridge rectifier! Hmm. Cool name. If you know who that is, that would have been funny. It it takes it and what it does, it chops the bottom, flips it on top, and makes it look like an AC signal. And the same thing happens with DC. You can turn an AC signal into DC by flipping the negative to a positive. It's kind of jagged. It's not a pure DC signal, but we have the ability to make AC to DC, and that's what the inverter does. Sometimes inside that inverter, you do have the gateway, which is either sold as a separate unit or combined, and you can log into that and flip that switch too. Yeah, it's uh, probably way off topic. We can maybe chat about it later, but I was actually looking at some of this stuff for uh, powering a pool pump, and like you get into a whole different um, kind of situation with motors, electronic motors because the the way motors work and the the sine waves that come out of some um, inverters isn't clean enough to run a motor properly. So like yeah. people were like, yeah, you could try to attach it to your pool pump, but it's gonna burn it up. Like it's not gonna not gonna run right with certain motors. So like you gotta be careful with some of these things, but it's kind of a little bit of a sidebar. But um, we wanted on the show to kind of take some of the things that you have on your solar network and use some of the software to maybe you know analyze some of that data coming out and uh, use some of our our dot net and uh, blazer um, software to you know visualize this and and make our own version of like a monitoring app and i, I think this will be a a fun project for the summer, especially for those that are interested in looking more into solar power and learning more about it. Cause like, like you're saying, there's a lot of statistics that are coming out of that, uh, that gateway that are, you know, that I need to learn about just to kind of help build the software, but I, I'm interested in learning about because, you know, solar power is getting to be such a, a hot topic. I just kind of wanted to learn more about it and, you, you seem to have quite a bit of knowledge around the subject. So here we are. The discovery for me too. Like when I first looked at the data that was coming out, I'm like, oh, what's this? It's like a new a new bit of data that I was not aware of before. So it, this is fun. And um, I think that each thing will inform the next thing that we want to do. So we look at, oh, here's a list of values that we can get every second this comes in. Every second we get a new value for this thing. How can we visualize in the way that is useful in the real world, right? And I don't have to wait for an interstellar Uber to get here. <laughs> I think any anytime you're dealing with the real world, real, real world data, it's more inspiring than uh, you know using the same old sample data that you've been using, uh, yeah. you know, perhaps to build sample apps and whatnot. There, there's only so many Contoso apps and so many to-do <laughs> lists we can build, right, Justin? Absolutely. Uh, I try to I try to make like some fun like stream ideas and the whole travel one like essentially was um, it was your your taxi 
data analysis from like it's taxi analysis is like the the to-do list of machine learning right so i was like well taxis seem boring like so i just tacked on a couple extra zeros to the cost of the taxi output and i was like hey we're traveling through space folks <laughs> <laughs> it was like just got to make it interesting somehow so you know having something that's founded in the real world i think is a little more entertaining it feels a little more fulfilling when you complete it because you know you can apply that knowledge somewhere where like building the quote the hero app angulars to-do list for like the hundredth time is just like okay we've done this before whether it's grocery shopping or whatever it's to-do list like everybody's done the to-do list let's do something new um and then i have a degree in electronics so I, I understand the values and things that are coming out of the solar stuff, but I don't understand how they're applied in the real world. And I think that's that's going to be interesting because um, the things that I know, like the foundations of of uh, electronics I know are for like microelectronics, not like electricity, yep. which the fundamentals, like the calculations, things like that are the same, but the application is just widely different like you're dealing with you know megawatts not you know microwatts <laughs> and uh not not as much like you know dc logic and stuff like that it's more like you said inverters and dc to ac and uh th that whole bar ballpark and uh it's done for power applications not like uh, when you talk about electronics, it's usually like you're doing DC to AC for like communications. Like you're trying to get like a signal from, uh, you know, the digital world to the uh, to transmit it over radio frequency for like Wi-Fi, something like that. So like the conversions are different. Like you're doing it for different reasons. Um, there's like this focus on uh you know signal to loss ratio all of that i don't know how that applies in in the solar panel world or if it does so it'll be interesting to see yeah i think there's a lot of uh, opportunity here for us to individually apply our real world experience and where it might inform the, the final application because i think of this as a tablet on my wall Right. You kind of think of, we get lost in these demos and projects. We start with one thing, but we don't actually think about what happens after it's done. Right. I want to do the to-do. Oh, I need a SQL connection. Oh, I want SQL Lite. Oh, I want this. I want this. But then you don't think, am I going to use the to-do app later? No. Right. Uh, because I didn't do push notifications or something like that. Right. Or there's a better one out there. But of course, there's something to be said about going through the process of doing it. Right, because you learn how to do certain things, but once you have that fundamental knowledge, what's the point of doing it again? In this case, the point of doing it again is that we will hope to see a real world useful application of this. It'll be on GitHub and anyone out there who has an inverter or gateway that gives you an MQTT signal, it will work. If you have Home Assistant, it will work for you. You just put in your the, uh, the IP address of your gateway. So it's helpful for us and everyone too. But I want to see a tablet that's like right next to the front door, you know, one of those little four or five inch Android tablets and just have it uh, connected to the site. And it would be hopefully uh, Linux containers. I did some early testing and runs pretty good in a container. You see Blazor kicking butt out there. Yeah, we'll have to get a like a proof of concept going and then like i can work on some design stuff too i'm pretty handy in that department so like you said you want it on the wall at home you don't want it to look you know like it's being shot out of a linux container <laughs> <laughs> not that linux can't look good i've seen some you know ubuntu's got some good looking uh uh themes and things like that but when you think of that side of uh, the business it's usually you know you get that java-esque like app applet thing comes to mind and you're like, oh, cringe. Now we've got uh, Telerik UI for Blazor and, and the web and I can theme that and make that look nice. So we can have some nice visualizations and that sort of thing going on. Um, 
do you want to show maybe some of the components that go into a system like this? Like what some of the solar panels you have look like, um, anything that you might have on hand that you could kind of share with us, so whether it's a uh, you know, link we can pull up on screen here or any pictures you might have that are shareable? I don't think I did some drone footage, but I did the drone footage before I put the solar panels out. Uh, but let me see. Like even if there's like a, you said it was Tesla, so like it, it there there's like a site we can go to and just like show people what it is. Yeah, it's that they could call. they could buy or you have bought or I don't know how much uh, information you want to share about your own setup, but it does depend on like how many power walls you're getting, right? So it can range in cost between. 12,000 to 40,000. It really depends on how many panels that you want. It, th there's a reason the first question they ask you when you throw this out is how much energy does your house use? Where do you live? And do you want battery backup? Those are the main contributors to cost because it tells you how many panels you need to meet the need of the house during the day. And do you want surplus to charge the battery for night use? So you need enough solar panels above the regular use to charge the battery long enough, strong enough to last through the whole night. So it, the cost can go up very quickly depending on how much self-powered you want to be. Um, and this is, uh, it's not unique to Tesla, right? No matter what battery system you're using, what inverter you're using, uh, and it also, you got to consider, do you want your 220 volt appliances on the system? Because you need to have a separate inverter for 220 volts. Things like your dryer and your washer or hot water heaters, stuff like that, that aren't on the 120 volt system. You would then need two inverters, one for 120 volts, one for 220 volts, 240, I'm sorry. All right, so you have the 240 line going in, being powered by the batteries, same batteries, same solar system, but is being inverted differently. But yeah, let's show what it actually looks like. And I'll bring up Tesla's site. And yeah, there we go. So on top of the panels, you can see there's, oh, I'm trying to zoom in, but the background image doesn't zoom. <laughs> but you can see how they're kind of low profile. So this is what you get with brand name, right? So brand name, um, you get a little more fancier looking. See, they're very flat and they have this little black ledge that is flush with the roof. And they're meant to kind of blend in and look aesthetically very pleasing to the eye. Um, so they cost a little bit more. There are other panels that are cheaper. They don't have the edging and they might not be completely black on the top. And <clears throat> they might not do infrared radiation. Some panels work when there are clouds because the infrared gets through the clouds even though visible light is blocked. It's not as much energy as if there were no clouds, but you're still getting energy generation. So we can see yeah. they have, go ahead. Did, um, did their shingle ever take off or mm -hmm. is that? Not a thing yeah. anymore. No, I've heard it's doing well. It's called uh, solar roof. So yeah, that's a good point. We'll switch to that after we look at the battery. And, and what the uh, what, one more question: Do they is Solar City still an entity, or is it all absorbed into Tesla now? Last I heard, it was being absorbed, but as far as like a legal separate entity, I'm not sure. And coincidentally enough, Solar City is the manufacturer of my inverter. So when I got the Tesla system back in maybe 2019, 2019, 2020, Solar City was a separate company then, but they were the vendor that Tesla used for Boston. And they kind of did all the work. Yeah. But it makes sense that they absorbed them because then you don't need the separate contractor and all of the hardware is under one roof. Are they the manufacturer of the components as well as the installer? Um, most of it, honestly, is usually Chinese-based or Taiwan-based. Like the components inside of the, the the gateway itself, 
So the outside of the gate will be branded with Solar City or insert your vendor name here for California or Ohio or wherever, right? Uh, but usually the hardware inside of it is the same from like the same original manufacturer. Tesla though, um, I believe they have a lot of like in-house stuff that is replacing most of it. Um, like they have the gigafactories where they're building the batteries for the cars. It's similar, but the components that go into that are still internationally sourced. We're not 100% separate yet. Yeah, back in back in the day when it was Solar City, uh, I knew a developer that worked on some of uh, the apps internally, and they were using web forms, which I thought was interesting for a uh, Bay Area company. Right. I want to see that that job listing. Do you know it has been <laughs> agents? Yeah. Are you all there? So this picture here, right, switches the other side of the house. You get a little closer look. And they fit a couple panels here too. They all connect into the same system. This thing you see over here on the right is the power wall. It is a thin battery design. They should have a picture. Here's a better picture. So it's tall. You can see it in comparison to a normal size door, right? It's that tall. It's about um six inches deep so it comes off the wall about six inches and these are stackable so depending on how much energy you need stored for the battery system you can stack one on top of this one to do them together or side by side and i kind of given you an earlier shot at the app so this is a tesla app where <clears throat> you can see the current value, um, charge value of the power wall. You can see how much is coming from the grid, how much is coming from the solar panels or roof. This particular app is using the roof. And right now the car is plugged in. That's one advantage to using something like Tesla is that if you have a, one of their cars, the charger for that car integrates with this system seamlessly. So you can see all of the, the energy going into the battery and the car's battery acts like another power wall. So your house can be run off your car if necessary. Yeah, so perhaps instead of two power walls, you just have one power wall and your Tesla and yep. your system's complete. But then if you have a long commute in the morning, that could be an issue. These are kind of things you learn like in the beginning, <laughs> the hard way or not. <laughs> And I'm trying to get a closer look at what the power wall looks like. Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. Can I spin it? No. But it's just basically this tall, thin thing. It's in my garage. I don't have my outside. I Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a real world situation with this being outside of the house. Um, but it doesn't get in the way. It's just nice and over in the corner. It looks nice as like this big, huge um, metal cable coming out. Like the, what are they called? Uh, cable protection. Conduits. Right? It's a big metal, yeah, big metal thing coming out. It looks all kind of cool. Now I want to see the power of roof. Uh, so these are panels, right? Uh, I forget the exact dimensions of them, but they have an expected amount of output depending on a certain amount of sunlight. And they have a standard that tells you this is a um, one kilowatt panel, for example. So you know what you can expect from that. Now, if you were considering something like this, you probably want to put new shingles on your roof first. Yes. But let's say you're building a new home and you have the opportunity or you need a new roof anyways. Right? I wouldn't say tear up your roof to put this in because solar tiles are not very efficient. Right? They're no way near as efficient as a panel. So if you have an existing roof there, you would want to put a panel on top of it. But if you're going to replace the tiles anyways, you know, and you want to put panels on top of that, why not consider the tiles? I don't remember the exact output difference, but let's say it's a tenth of the in a dedicated panel. But you're also getting your typical roof protection from the tile too. So imagine all of your roof is now these individual little solar panels, less efficient, but you have a lot more of them. 
we can generate a certain amount of energy just from the roof alone. Like that, what we're seeing there in that picture, those are all mini solar panels. Except for the cap units, the cap on the rows, I don't think those are. But they kind of snap into a rail system. So they install a, quite a rail across the whole thing and each tile snaps in to each part as you go along. Pretty cool. That looks good. I wonder how, how long they're expected to last. 25 years is the warranty. So probably last 30, maybe 40. Yeah, we just had our roof re-shingled probably about four years ago. And, um, you know, it's still in the zone of, you know, we could put panel solar panels on it if we wanted to, but if you if you need to like re-roof in the next couple of years, you probably want to bump that up to before you put panels up because they they have to take them down to re-roof your yeah. shingles. If anything, I would say um, combine the cost. Like consider it one big thing and you can pay it off over time because the earlier you buy it, the cheaper it's going to be, just by the nature of you know, inflation in the economy. Uh, now people are wondering like, well, will they break, right? Like tiles break. I think Tesla did a great job here with the side-by-side -side comparison with the hammer hit. So if you're worrying about hail and that kind of stuff, they're pretty resilient to hail, which is why they're like, yeah, we'll give you a 25-year warranty. And then again, um, you work with them, particularly when it comes to solar roof, even when you get solar panels, you do work with them to design how many you need. And then once you know how many panels you need, you get the dimensions of your roof and the safe places to put them. I live in a townhouse, so I guess we could kind of cut off this front part. So imagine my house being just this front part and I have panels on the front and the back. There's yeah, 13 these, in total uh, here. These companies, they they already have pictures of your roof because of satellite yep. photo photography <laughs> and stuff. It's pretty wild. And they can estimate like the square footage of the roof space off of the satellite photos. They have software for all of this stuff. What well, usually says. happens is they don't have enough roof space though, like for the number the amount of energy they need. Which is unfortunate. What were you gonna say, Justin? And probably decide which which side of the roof if there is enough roof space like which is getting the most sunlight depending on how your house is yeah, yeah. yeah they can uh, do pretty good estimates off the photos they have of like what you're able to generate and all of that yeah. they don't even have to come out to your house they it's just like they just pull it up on their map api and they're like oh yeah this is what you have this is the amount of space you have your son your your house is oriented towards the sun this part of the day like they know everything without showing up like in person yeah that so sounds like you could probably get a quote and have an estimate and an idea without having somebody climbing all over your roof yep usually by that for an appointment thanks this picture is how i have mine set up i don't have a an electric car so i don't have the charger part um but it kind of looks like this all right, where it's just inside the door. Actually, this is almost identically to where mine is, except my conduit comes out the top here. But that's all it is. Like inside the house, it's very slim, doesn't get in the way. And it, not everyone needs battery, though. So you, you judge your own needs on what are this additional cost, which is a large part of it, is worth it. Then you figure out how long. Like let's say you know you're going to be 80% powered self-powered and how much money does that save you in a year okay how many years before the system pays for itself for me that number was nine years i got it yeah i'm a little over halfway before it actually paid for itself in the electricity that i didn't have to buy yeah nine years isn't too bad of an investment when it comes to house stuff right um, yeah I'm not sure, like, you yeah, know, this is something that we've kind of looked at, like, we're not sure how long we're going to be here because our kids are at the age where they're like starting to leave home and stuff. We're like, I don't know if we're going to be here past five years. So we don't want to invest like too crazily in the house anymore, but we're, we are doing like a remodel, but it's nothing, 
you know, it's all like things that are going to benefit like resale value, stuff like that, which yeah. some of this stuff can, but not where we live in, like, we don't get a lot of, um, you know, we're in a colder climate, so we don't get the year long benefits of solar. So that one's kind of on the fence. The other thing I haven't mentioned is making money with your solar panels. So with a hybrid system, what if I, my, my solar panels are um, generating 2,000 watts, right? Um, two kilowatts, and my house is only using 500 watts. I have the surplus of 1,500 watts. And the battery is already fully charged. Where is all of this extra energy going? Usually nowhere, but the power company can flip a switch and start buying your surplus electricity. So I actually have two meters on my house. One meter is for the energy that goes out to the grid and the other meter is for the energy that I buy. And the meter that goes out to the grid actually runs in reverse. It's kind of funny. It doesn't count up to regular meter, but because the energy is going that way, it goes backwards. I, I think some systems will use a single meter, but in our case, we the law required us to have two. But I wonder the, if you're selling it to them at the same rate as you're buying it. You negotiate this usually. Um, it's slightly less, and but it, sometimes it's higher. Um, for example, about two or three weeks ago, there was a heat wave up here in Boston, not including the one that was last week across the whole country. This was like the very first hot days in Boston for this year. And um, I saw that flip on because it lets you know when this happens. I saw it flip on and, and I was getting at least eight cents more per kilowatt hour than usual. So that will be, that will change based on demand and depending on your agreement with your utilities provider. What's even funnier is I cannot sell electricity in Costa Rica. And this is why. Where my house is, there are wind farms and solar, like there is way too much energy being generated in the valley where I am. It's an RNL, like a top of a mountain range in the middle of the country. And there's a dip in that mountain range and there's a volcano ridge. And that volcano ridge has lakes and you kind of live around that, hot springs and stuff. But at the top where ridge is, there are huge wind farms. Um, and they just, they cannot buy it from you. So there is no way to connect to the ISP to sell electricity back there because they won't take it. Okay, let me think of anything else about the system that we did not mention. So we have our panels, we have our battery backup, maybe, maybe not. We have our inverter, which changes the, the energy that we generated into energy that the house can use. And then we also have the possibility of um, selling it back. For the purposes of this demo, I don't think we're really tracking the sellback part. And most of the data that comes out is specifically coming from the grid, how much is coming from the grid, how much is being generated by the solar panels, and how much is coming from the batteries. Those are the main three aspects. And then the fourth one is the load, which is the house. Yeah, this kind of gives us an idea of all the components involved though. So, you know, we've got the battery backup, the solar panel itself, the inverter, um, maybe a vehicle if there's, you know, you don't have one, but you know, that's a, a possibility in that scenario. And like you we, still we know what the pieces that, are now. Yeah, so yeah, that, I guess we can bucket that into energy storage. You have energy generation, the panels, or a solar roof, energy storage, the car, or the batteries. And Talking of energy storage, just as a side note, there are some cool things out there that they're working, <clears throat> they're experimenting with in different parts of the world where they store energy in a variety of ways. It's not a battery. So imagine you have a lake at the top of a mountain and a lake at the bottom of a mountain. And how much energy it takes to move that water from the bottom of the mountain to the top. Then think about how much energy it generates when the water falls off the mountain to the bottom to spin like a generator, like a Niagara Falls type of deal. They found out that during the day, you use solar panels, right? Your solar panels use 100% free energy to pump the water back to the top of the mountain. 
Then at night, you throw the water off the mountain to spin generators to generate electricity. So yeah, at no point clever. did you ever take it from the grid. Yeah. With no no chemical storage, it's all physical storage. It's yeah. really neat. I wonder what the efficiency rate of that is. I guess it would be the same. Or do you mean like compared to the energy that you got from the sun? Yeah, just how much you, I mean, the energy was free, but compared yeah. to just storing that energy, you use it to pump it up. And then how much energy are you getting from the, you know, the gravity weight of the water spinning the turbines on the way back down? Probably a lot of losses in the generation system itself, right? You don't get the full yeah. gravitational potential from it. I think you'd have to look at the cost of the storage system. Like are batteries going to, you know, what's the cost of installing batteries versus do I already have the infrastructure for this water storage system and how much does it take to build? <laughs> and then it's like, how, how long did that, does that last once it's in, you know, in place and maintenance on it? The one I saw is that they didn't build the water things. They used natural locations that Naturally were already occurring. like, yeah. So yeah, I saw, um, there's a good YouTube video. I'll have to dig it up for you. Um, this, this one YouTuber, he's got a, um, a house that's, extremely well insulated like it's i think it's a new build so it's you know well insulated new windows that sort of thing and he can pump ac at night when it's cold out or when the uh, energy costs are lower and basically refrigerate his house and he's like i you know i gotta throw long sleeve shirts and stuff on but the house is cold enough that it stays cold until like five six o'clock at night when the the ac has to kick back on so he's he's saving money by using you know the power grid when it's at its low point and basically using his house as a battery like pumping all the cold air in and using the ac during those low periods and then using the insulation of his home to save the energy i thought that was pretty interesting it's like okay it's comfortable all day as long as you you know wear like a sweater in the morning <laughs> Yeah. Most people like their house colder at night, anyways, right? Because you yeah. want to be under the blanket. So, yeah. And then you never owner. have to put your <laughs> <laughs> never have to put your fall clothes away. You just keep the sweaters out year round. Yeah. So we're gonna build off some of this stuff. We've got uh, you've got your proof of concept there. This is the um, this is this app is what comes with the. The inverter system the um, no. no the uh you're, you're right that it's come the data is coming from the inverter it comes from the gateway inside of the inverter but it, <clears throat> by default it doesn't have all this stuff like the tesla app that tesla lets you use through your gateway is a benefit of going with tesla um you don't pay for the app you don't pay for the service but when you get this, like a system that I built in Costa Rica, I bought the inverter separately, bought the batteries separately, bought the panels separately, had them all installed by qualified technicians. And the only data you really see is a window that's on the inverter. Um, matter of fact. So it's like a physical display on the inverter, is what you're saying? Yeah. So watch this grow. It's got like a what? little LCD screen on it or something. And it's horrible. It's exactly this one. So let's see if I can pull up the picture. Yeah, I, I kind of get a gist of. Yeah, so that's basically all you see. Is. There's little but icons it, that tell you the grid, but that's it, right? You have a, an icon that says the grid with a line connected to it. If, it. if it's not working, it has like a slash through the line. It's sufficient if that's all you need. All you, and if you you're all on that. premise, right? Uh, if exactly. you're on premises, like yeah, you have to be there to see it. But that data is there and available if you know how to use an API or have an app that knows how to use the API. Exactly. So the inverter has the ability to um, be a MQTT broker. So in a setting in the inverter, um, you connect. A lot of inverters and gateways have Wi-Fi. This particular one doesn't. Um, so I have a, a USB cable connected to the inverter, connected to a Raspberry Pi. And on that Raspberry Pi, I bought this software called Solar Assistant. 
It's fifty dollars, probably the best fifty bucks I've ever spent. Worth every penny to give these devs, right? People forgot to pay for software along the way in the past thirty years, and in this case, um, it was one click buy. It's like, oh, you can connect directly to the inverter, my inverter's model, and it knows how to connect to that with um, with that model's API. This is not MQTT yet. I misspoke a second ago. So this is the app that is connected to the inverter over USB. It knows that model and the way that model interacts with the software will let us see all of this data. So it tells me right now, uh, the solar panel, what mode is my inverter in? You can tell your inverter to operate in different modes. I'll get into more later about that. How much is coming from the grid and how charged is my battery? You can see here, this is the last 24 hours about, yeah. At a quick glance, right, you get a quick look up at, oh, um, you can see the curve of the sun going up. It's pretty cool. When, you, when we look at the historical data, we'll see that a little more easily. We can see in blue um, how much the house is using. This is in watts. So on average, it's like, idling around what 250 there about if we average all that out and this is 250 watts from no one's there right now so it's all of the networking and the cameras and the solar panels and everything to keep the house at its base state and 250 watts is you know three old style light bulbs the red line is how much i'm pulling from the grid you might ask, okay, how come there's no red here? It's because in this section, the battery was powering. Well, both the grid, and, I mean, um, both the solar and the battery were powering the house during this time because there is zero energy coming from the grid. Then around 10 p.m., my battery ran out. And that when the battery ran out, there's no more sun. There's no more yellow, right? No more sun. And there's no more battery. So then it switches over to the grid and it starts firing the house. The sun comes up in the morning, starts charging the battery, and then it'll, once the battery gets to a certain level, which I have set in the settings, then it'll switch to battery and solar only. And we can see here, um, for the past 24 hours, the, the battery's power output is in watts and the state of charge of the battery over the past 24 hours. You can see this is when it ran out at 10 o'clock, right? We look up here and say, oh, it's 10 o'clock. I'm using the grid, but down here in the battery, it's like, oh, why do I have to use the grid at 10 o'clock? Well, that's when the battery went to zero. You might be asking, uh, it's at 75, not zero, because I need to change the scale of this. I had to manually in input how much the battery is in total. At 75 really means zero in this case. So you can see it slowly draining, slowly draining, slowly draining. The power output right there. We see the batteries being charged here, being discharged here, and nothing at all. Nothing because there's no solar power. And then start charging when the sun comes up again. Is that all pretty straightforward? Do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Let's take a look at the charts. Now, remember, this is software running on a Raspberry Pi connected over USB cable to the inverter. Some can do it over Wi-Fi. I prefer, in this case, don't rely on the Wi-Fi because if I'm updating it, disconnects all that good stuff. So let's change this to the last two days. This tab, now that we're starting to get a sense of the data that we can get, we can start to, in the back of your mind, think about what our app might want to do. right? What we're seeing here is kind of like the fire hose. We don't need the fire hose because the software does it, but we want something that's more usable, one click glance, or maybe one touch to see some details on something. Well, on this page, the top chart is the overview, which is similar to the little chart we saw on the dashboard. Same thing with battery power and battery state of charge. But now we're starting to see some other things. MPPT means the solar panels. 
So this is the voltage coming out of the solar panel. 51 volts, you know, throughout the day, depends on the strength of the sun. And you can see the current that's being output. It's in amps, I believe. This inverter supports two bays of panels. I only have one bay, but that's why there's a solar panel bay two data there. Power um, is, I forget the formula, voltage times watts is power, but we get the actual power output here. We don't see a battery temperature and it's because I don't have a power wall down there. I had to buy individual little power wall uh, batteries and you stack them up to build up how much voltage you need. And that is not a battery management system, they're individual batteries. Um, and the rest is some important information that all gets spewed out of the inverter. And how can we access this data is the next question that we should ask. The way we should do this is, and let's scroll quickly because I didn't want to go through all those details. Um, we can enable the MQTT broker. So this, Solar Assistant software is very cool for me because it takes the signals from the inverter. It understands the protocol for the inverter. This is a common brand. It's a popular brand. Um, and it becomes an MQTD broker. So every time it gets this information from the inverter, it shoots out, if it's enabled, it shoots out a packet of MQTT data. And the way that protocol works is you have a client and you have a broker. The broker's job is just to let everyone else know if something happened. So we have a, in fact, I got this for that reason. So the broker is a relay. Is that big enough? It's like a pub sub. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So one client publishes something, the broker's responsibility is to send it out to any subscribers to that topic. So on this topic here, they want to say, hey, I want to hear, uh, I want to get notices for temperature slash roof. They're all relative URLs, they're paths. So you, your topics are paths. And the same thing is true with solar system. So every piece of data that it gets, it will send it out in a message. If you subscribe to it, you'll get that comes out about once every second, but we can get into those details as we subscribe to it and start using it. But at this point, we can start to write an app. So we understand the foundation of what the hardware is, the software in the middle with the inverter, the gateway, and the MQTT broker. Nice. So this thing will be publishing messages out, and then we can use some kind of software to pick those messages up. We can write it to databases. We can write UI up against it, that sort of thing. Exactly. And we can go wild with it. Like this is a developer's dream to have just this fire hose of data. And that's kind of what it is. As long as we subscribe to the topics that we want to listen for, we'll get it. Yeah, so on the, the next show, we could talk a little bit about more about this MQTT, what it is, how it works um some of the protocols um because we it uses uh web socket or not so web it uses sockets not web sockets right so we, we talk tcp to, sockets yeah. through tcp sockets um so we've got some uh dot net uh server infrastructure that we can use with it um and then we can we can write uis on whatever we collect from that infrastructure. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I think you guys need to get back to uh, the job that pays. <laughs> so um, I will let you all go. We will be back next week though, all of us for another show. We'll pick up from here um, and start working on some of the infrastructure architecture and uh, building up like a .NET server and things like that. Uh, so next Wednesday, 11 o'clock, 
uh, join us for another Blazer Solar Power Hour. So the topic of the summer is going to be solar, folks. And uh, if you joined us today, uh, thank you. And I uh, hope you learned something about solar power. I know I did. Uh, Lance, uh, special thanks to you, you know, sharing all this knowledge about solar with us. Uh, it's, again, something I wanted to learn more about, and you're doing a good job sharing that knowledge with us. Uh, Justin, it's nice to have you here as well. Uh, we'll dive into some coding and stuff, and uh, it'll be great to have you on board with that. And um, Looking forward to making something this summer. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, Ed. I'm, I'm excited to dig in and hopefully help out a little bit. All right, guys, join us next week for the next Blazer Solar Power Hour. We'll see you soon.